there is only one boss, and that's the customer. And he can fire everyone in the company, from the CEO on down, by simply spending his money elsewhere. This was said by a young boy who changed the way Americans shopped and became one of the world's richest men in the process. Retailing giants like Kmart, Sears, and Woolworths never saw the scrappy, pickup driving country boy coming thanks to his aw shucks demeanor and rural targeting strategy. And by the time they realized what was going on, it was too late to stop him. Sam Walton grew up on a farm in Oklahoma, born to Thomas and Nancy Walton. In 1940, he began what would be a lifelong career in retail by working as a sales trainee at a J.C. Penney store in Des Moines, Iowa. Walton attended Hickman High School and then the University of Missouri before starting his first job. Walton was enthusiastic about his job, but he was never one of J.C. Penney's most attentive employees. He despised making customers wait while he fiddled with paperwork, so his books were a mess. His boss even threatened to fire him, claiming that he was not suited for retail work. Walton's ability as a salesman saved him, and he added about $25 per month in commissions to his beginner salary. Walton was drafted into the United States Army in 1942 and served as a communications officer in the Army Intelligence Corps for the duration of World War II. When Walton was discharged from the military in 1945, he had a wife, Helen, and a child to support, so he decided to go it alone. At the age of 27, Walton purchased a Ben Franklin variety store in Newport, Arkansas, a franchise division of Butler Brothers of Chicago, with $5,000 of his own money and $20,000 borrowed from his father-in-law. Walton quickly tripled his business through hard work and a policy of pricing products far below what other retailers charged, and by 1950, he owned the leading Ben Franklin store in a six-state region. The success of the store was not lost on Walton's landlord, who decided to buy it for his son. Because Sam had no plans to sell, the landlord simply refused to renew his lease. Most people would have given up after that experience. Walton, on the other hand, looked for a new place to do business in rural towns like Little Rock, Arkansas, and found it in the tiny town of Bentonville. He set up shop in a store on the town square, insisting on a 99-year lease this time. Walton's Five and Dime first opened its doors in the summer of 1950. There were two other variety stores in town, but neither of them had the same consistently low prices as Walton. As a result, the new venture quickly replicated the success of his previous venture, prompting Walton to seek out other similar opportunities. Throughout the 1950s, Walton acquired one variety store after another, using borrowed money and profits from stores he already owned. He was the proud owner of 15 stores by 1960, but he wasn't seeing the profits he'd hoped for and he felt he could be making more money for the amount of work he was putting in. He decided to put a new strategy of drastically lowering the prices in the hopes of undercutting his competition and making up the difference in price through increased sales volume. The practice wasn't exactly new, but at the time, discount stores were small, concentrated in cities, and only sold specialized items. Walton's plan was to build large stores in small towns that discounted everything they sold. Initially, he pitched his idea to the company that franchised Ben Franklin stores, when Walton clarified they would have to cut their standard wholesale profit in half to accommodate the low prices he intended to charge, the company directors loudly refused to support him. As a result, Walton decided to take the risk himself. He opened his first Walmart with the help of his brother and co-founder, Bud Walton, mortgaging his home and borrowing to the max. Originally known as Walmart Discount City, the first store opened its doors in 1962 in Rogers, Arkansas, not far from Bentonville. Walton wasn't alone in his venture into discounting. Kmart was launched the same year and Woolworths launched Woolco, both of which could have easily surpassed Walmart. But Walton was too far off the beaten path for these retail behemoths to notice him. Rural customers flocked to Walton stores, thrilled that the big city New York discounting had arrived in small town America, and sales skyrocketed. This early success provided funding for further expansion and by 1969, Arkansas and Missouri had 18 Walmarts, until then, Walton had funded expansion through profits and borrowing, but in 1970, he decided to go public. Although Walton and his family retained 61% ownership of the stock in the initial offering, the profits allowed him to pay off the business debts and move forward with his ambitious expansion plans. Walmart added six stores in the first year after going public, followed by 13 stores in each of the next two years, then 14, then 26. By the end of 1980, Walton had 276 stores and was on track to open 100 new stores per year. In 1983, Walton introduced the first Sam's Club, which catered to small business owners and others looking to buy in bulk. Walton had struck gold yet again. Forbes magazine named him the richest man in America in 1985, with a net worth of $2.8 billion. By 1987, 
Walmart had surpassed Sears and Kmart to become the third largest retailer in the United States. With retail successes under his belt, Walmart founder Sam Walton announced in 1988 that he would relinquish the role as CEO to Walmart executive David Glass while remaining chairman of the company. That same year, Walmart opened their Walmart Supercenter, a chain of retail outlets with all the fixings of Walmart with the addition of a full-service supermarket. Walton was diagnosed with an aggressive form of bone cancer two years later. Even this unsettling condition couldn't reduce his competitive spirit. Walton predicted at Walmart's annual meeting in June 1990 that the company's revenue would quintuple to $125 billion within the next decade. Over the next two years, Walmart surpassed Kmart and Sears to become the largest retailer in the United States. President George Bush awarded Walton the Medal of Freedom on March 17, 1992 for his entrepreneurial spirit and concern for his employees and community. It would be his final and most significant accomplishment. Walton was admitted to the University of Arkansas Hospital a few days later and died on April 5, 1992, six days after his 74th birthday. He had a net worth of nearly $25 billion at the time of his death. The Sam M. Walton College of Business was named in his honor by the University of Arkansas shortly after his death. Retailing was not invented by Walton, nor was the automobile invented by Henry Ford. But just as Henry Ford's assembly line revolutionized American manufacturing, Walton's relentless pursuit of discounting revolutionized America's service economy. Walton didn't just change the way Americans shopped, he also changed the philosophy of the American retail business establishment, initiating the shift of power from manufacturer to consumer that has become common in industry after industry. His trailblazing ideas paved the way for a new breed of category killer retailer. The Home Depots, Barnes & Nobles, and Blockbusters of the world and forever altered the retail landscape. Walmart's total revenue for the fiscal year ending in January 2022 was $650 billion. In 11,766 store locations worldwide, the company employs 2.2 million people. The company, which was once a haven for rural shoppers, expects to generate $50 billion in online revenue by 2022. The Walton family, on the other hand, took a hit in May 2022 when their earnings report revealed a $19 billion loss, dropping 11% in New York City Wall Street trading. The drop reflects inflationary pressures to raise prices, though higher prices were never in Walton's vocabulary. Walton's three children, Jim, Rob, and Alice, now own nearly half of the Walmart store businesses through Walton Enterprise and their individual holdings. Walton's late son, John, was succeeded in the family business by his daughter-in-law, Christy, and grandson, Lucas. The Walton family still has a say in Walmart and runs the Walton Family Foundation. Walmart was one of the first major businesses to offer profit sharing to all employees, including the lowest paid, Walton recognized that profit-sharing provided employees with a stake in the company's success and encouraged employee teamwork. When Walton opened his first Walmart in 1962, he challenged a widely held belief among retailers at the time. The more you charge, the more profit you make. Walton remains a business success model more than 30 years after his death. And with that being said, it's time to end our video. Subscribe to this channel for more amazing videos like this, and we'll see you with another interesting story.